Hello, everyone, and welcome to another SNEA educational webcast. Today, we're going to talk about NVMe over TCP. My name is Christine McMonagall. I'm the Director of Hyperconverged Marketing at Intel, as well as a contributor to the SNEA NSF. I will be the moderator for the webcast today. A few quick points concerning the BrightTalk interface. First, you can expand the screen size to see additional details. Simply enlarge the screen to full screen mode. Second, you can ask questions during the presentation by selecting the ask question option on your screen and enter that in. And third, and perhaps most importantly, you can rate the presentation. This is important to us as it gives us a solid indication of whether we're delivering the right quality and depth of content. A score of one means you would rather have spent your time more wisely and a score of five means it met the expectations set in the abstract. You can also give us your comments and let us know if you have other topic ideas you'd like to hear about. I already introduced myself, but let me introduce Eric Smith, Distinguished Engineer at Dell Technologies, who will be the presenter today. If you're not familiar with SNEA, it's a global not-for-profit association dedicated to advancing the adoption of storage technology. We do so using our vendor neutral status to develop industry-wide standards for which we enlist the participation of our member companies and other subject matter experts in the community. And then we promote those standards to increase awareness and use educational programs to aid adoption. There are many working groups and forums in SNEA. We're part of the NSF, the networking storage forum that focuses on a broad range of topics that you can see here. And this is the standard legal notice. Before we get into the details, this is the disclaimer. The basis of this is to remind you that the material is SNEA copyright. You can use it as is without modification and credit SNEA, but SNEA is not providing any warranties express or implied in the content of this presentation. Use it at your own risk. So without further delay, let me pass it over to Eric to cover the agenda. Excellent. Thanks, Christine. Again, as Chris, Christine mentioned, my name is Eric Smith. I am a distinguished engineer working for Dell Technologies as a member of the CTIO uh, team. Um, today, we're going to, I'll start with an overview of NVMe TCP and give you um, an overview of the enhancements that have been made to the protocol over the past four or five years. Uh, we'll talk about briefly about performance, uh, what you can expect, um, get into some deployment considerations. Uh, then we'll have a brief section on automation where I'll provide a, a demo, and then we'll have a Q&A. So um, just a little bit of background information about the presentation. Um, it will provide practical deployment considerations for NVMe TCP, but we're not going to attempt to cover all the aspects of NVMe TCP here. There's just too much information to do that. Now, if you want a detailed description of the protocol, um, there are additional resources available. Um, the best and, and place where I would start would be uh, what NVMe TCP means for network storage. Uh, this was posted four years ago, still accurate today. And, um, and it was presented by Siggy Grimberg, who uh, was primarily responsible for the NVMe TCP specification and Jay Metz, uh, and is really the best way to get an overall understanding of the NVMe TCP protocol. That's where I started, and uh, it was really helpful. Um, but we also have a SNEA network storage forum presentation, um, discovery automation for NVMe IP-based SANs, uh, provides a high-level overview of discovery automation related enhancements that have been added since NVMe TCP was first introduced. There's also a SNEA SDC Discovery Protocol Deep Dive, where we really get into the details of how discovery automation and the protocols work. And then from a security perspective, we have security of data on NVMe over Fabrics the Armored Truckway. It was pre uh, presented by Claudio DeSanti, also from Dell. Uh, and, it, and it gives you um, some security considerations. We'll, we'll talk briefly about that today as well. So when I think about um, NVMe TCP, I, I really think about start with NVMe, and it's and I think of it as an evolution from SCSI to NVMe. And uh, it starts with the idea that um, you know we first had NVMe drives located on the host and were used for mainly for caching and boot drive use cases. 
And it wasn't long before we embedded them in the back of an array and so noticed that there was a significant performance improvement uh, by using NVMe SSDs. And um, it wasn't long after that that we decided um, or we figured out that customers would want to be able to take advantage of these NVMe SSDs, low latency, uh, parallel access. And to do that, uh, a new protocol uh, was, was proposed uh, to allow that to happen, and it's NVMe over fabrics. And so um, when you think of traditional fiber channel, uh, you're thinking about SCSI FCP, SCSI over fiber channel. And also, if you wanted to SCSI over IP, it's, that's generally speaking iSCSI that you would use for that. Pro that, for that. Um, with NVMe, something similar. We have NVMe, NVMe over fabrics. And NVMe over fabrics, um, if you wanted to do, go over fiber channel, you can do that with NVMe FC. And if you wanted to go over IP, there's a bunch of options, one of which is NVMe TCP, but there's NVMe Rocky, there's NVMe, I, you know, you can go over iWarp. Um, there's a bunch of different transports available. So that's just a high-level overview of, of NVMe and, and, uh, and SCSI as they, as they relate to one another. Now, before we dive into too many more details, I just want to level set on the NVMe IP-based SAN terminology because it's a little different from what many are probably used to if you're coming from the fiber channel world. Uh, of course, we have hosts and storage. Um, they're, they're called something slightly different here. Uh, we have a network that connects them. But we also have this thing called a centralized discovery controller. Um, and uh, and it's where we envision maybe an administrator, a SAN administrator, would, would probably interact with to establish connectivity between hosts and storage. Um, we refer to generally the, the host and storage as endpoints. Um, and they're identified by NVMe qualified or names or NQNs and IP addresses. Uh, we have an IP network, and, and most 25 gig capable switches uh, will just work with NVMe TCP. Um, uh, not, not so much the case with 10 gig. There are some limitations there um, due to architectures. We don't have time to get into it, but um, I can provide more detail if needed. And um, the, the, the storage is typically referred to as a subsystem with NVMe. Um, and you can think of it as analogous to, an ICE, to a SCSI target, it's, but it's the storage array, or it could be a software-defined or a hardware-based. Um, and it's also, again, identified by an NQN. And if you're not familiar with what the NQN is, just think of it as a similar function to the worldwide unique node name in Fiber Channel or the IQN in ICC. And then we have um, the centralized discovery controller instances. And um, if, if you're familiar with the concept of a vSAN, a CDC instance can be thought of like the set of fabric services that are made available to a vSAN in Fiber Channel. Um, and it's basically just a collection of uh, services that are enabling discovery. And then direct discovery controllers, the DDCs, these were the original dis discovery controllers defined uh, for NVMe. And uh, it, it, they typically reside on subsystems, uh, and I mean storage platforms. Uh, and you know, hosts can directly connect to storage via the DDC. They were doing that before any of the enhancements I'm about to talk to were supported. Um, but there's a there's a downside to it, and that's that uh, you don't get central the benefits of centralization, uh, which are you know um, easier to easier to provision and uh, and uh, scalability. Hey, Eric, we've had a, a few comments or questions come in on this slide that maybe we could cover before you move to the next section. Sure. Uh, someone was asking or said they believe that NVMe over fiber channel is also widely deployed. Is that is that true? I, I don't, well, um, it's it's supported. Um, I'm not sure widely deployed uh, would be a, a, a fair way to say, a uh, fair way to describe it. I think, mm. um, you know, a lot of the enhancements that were made to uh, enable performance with NVMe um, and you know parallel access and 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 things of that nature are also sort of backported to SCSI. Um, so the the performance delta you see between SCSI FCP and NVMe, as I'll show you in a second, are actually not really that it's not really that big of a delta anymore. So I think that's a part of the reason why people haven't gone to FC NVMe um, completely. Oh, got it. And then we got a question on is is CDC a, a vendor specific thing or is it a protocol? Uh, the centralized discovery controller was uh, acts actually a standards-based term, um, and it's you know centralized discovery controller. Uh, it's defined in in NVM Express Technical Proposal uh, TP8010, 
Um, and so it's it's something that the, a group of people came up with and, and decided to call it the centralized discovery controller. You'll, you'll hear me later on in this presentation refer to smart fabric storage software, which is an implementation of, of a CDC. But uh, yeah, CDC is a standard term. Got it. OK. And then this might be something you're going to get to in the next section. But do you see any issues with virtual block storage behind NVMe over fabrics, specifically things like ZFS, ZVols? versus raw NVMe disks, which is something already done with iSCSI. Yeah, no, I, I don't. Um, and, and we could have a longer discussion about it, but I mean, we're, we're, cert we're basically presenting block volumes, block devices to the upper layer protocol. Um, I actually have a, um, uh, I actually have a pretty good presentation on that as well, um, but I, I won't get into any of those details today. But I, I, in the Q and A that we Q and A blog we put out, I'll make sure to put in a link to that uh, to that resource. Oh, terrific! That sounds great. Okay, why don't you go ahead on okay. to the next section? Thanks. Performance. Um, so, just some quick notes about the performance testing. Um, I, I want to be really clear up front and say that you know NVMe over fiber channel uh, performs really well. Uh, at 32 gig fiber channel, you know, that, that link speed, I, it, NVMe FC provided the highest IOPS, the lowest latency, and the lowest overall CPU utilization in general. And you'll see that in the data I'm going to show you in a minute. Um, I also wanted to let you know that the performance related metrics that I'm going to share with you were captured during testing at Dell. Um, and, uh, but you know, we didn't want to leave it, uh, have you take our word for it. So, we published a white paper called the NVMe Transport Performance Comparison White Paper, and it contains deep, more information about the testing and how you can reproduce our results. Uh, that's the important piece there. It just, you know, we tried to be as transparent as possible with how we tested things. Um, okay. So um, the performance test configuration that we used for Fiber Channel consisted of four hosts, they were VMware, um, and two switches, a SAN A, SAN B type of configuration. And then uh, uh, an array. In this case, it was it was PowerStore, um, but it's a you know it's an array. And so uh, we tried to distribute the host to storage connectivity as equally as we could across the entire array. And uh, and so that's the fiber channel based configuration. We used VD Bench as the application driving. Uh, VD Bench was installed in each VM. Each VM had eight volumes. Um, and uh, yeah, so we'll just leave it there. Very similar configuration for our Ethernet-based configuration. We had four hosts, all running ESX, same, same version. In this case, we had a, a switch A, switch B, but they were VLT together. We did have different VLANs for the storage, you know, for a SAN A, SAN B, logical SAN A, SAN B. But again, we distributed the volumes across all the front end interfaces. And there were uh, you know, two VMs per host, total of eight VMs with, uh, with eight volumes assigned to each VM. So they're very similar configurations, and that was done intentionally. We wanted to do an apples to apples comparison if we could. So the performance comparison, um, here we have uh, the total IOPS. So when we, we captured all the results, we summed them all together, we said, what did we see with each protocol? Now we did six different test runs, um, and they were for six different transport protocol configurations. The first one, it's, this is a little hard to see. It's iSCSI with an MTU of 1,500. Uh, that's the blue color. The orange color is iSCSI with an MTU of 9K. We also have NVMe TCP at 1,500 and 9K. And then this, this aqua color here is NVMe FC. And then fiber channel protocol, standard uh, traditional fiber channel is what I'd refer to it as. And so we used iSCSI 1,500 as the baseline and measured all the results. Uh, you know, and evaluated all the results according to that. And so in this chart, higher is better. So it's, you know, a pretty common pattern that you'll see if you look at the performance testing data, again, in that white paper, is that you're going to see iSCSI is typically the lowest performer, slowest performer. NVMe TCP is typically in the middle, pretty close to NVMe FC and FCP, with NVMe FC uh, being the, you know, the highest performer and FCP being a close follower. And that, that's, this is a IOP, this, this is 4K, 100% read. And uh, similar, similar thing going on over here for, um, for a, a 4K, 50-50 read write. Uh, very, very close for NVMe TCP and FC. Um, similar for the 100% you know, write and 
And again, I, I chose 4K because uh, that was one convenient block size that I felt like represented the overall results fairly well. Um, bl larger block sizes is going to be, of course, slightly different. But um, again, I'm trying not to mislead anybody. So I'm just uh, just wanted to make sure that that was clear. Um, okay, so that's for IOPS. We also, in the, in the white paper, uh, have information about latency. Um, didn't want to go into that too much detail here. Uh, another important um, comparison is uh, overall CPU utilization. And um, again, we used iSCSI uh, at 1500 MTU as the baseline. And uh, for the 100% write case, iSCSI at MTU of 9K actually was just uh, used slightly more CPU. But then um, you know, for the NVMe TCP and the fiber channel cases, they're very close. Um, you know, again, the best here is FC NVMe. Uh, and same thing for 100% read. Um, and 50-50, and then we got the 70-30 as well. And again, the, the purpose wasn't to go into exhaustive detail about the performance numbers. It's just to sort of give you an idea of where the three protocols sort of, re, uh, three transports re, relate to one another. And, uh, uh, and um, yeah, so if there's more information, again, you can see the white paper. So now switching over to deployment considerations. Um, when we, and I, by, by we, I mean the NVM Express FMDS working group, uh, defined a standard solution to allow for the discovery of discovery controllers. And um, prior to this, discovery was manual. You had to do it, and I'll show you in, a, in another slide how you had to go about configuring your storage. Um, and what we wanted to get out of the project that we were working on together, and this, again, started three, almost four years ago, I think, at this point, um, uh, we wanted to see it automated. Uh, no explicit configuration or seed information should be required to provide to the host. The host should be able to discover the storage that was allocated to it without explicit configuration. Um, we wanted it to be dynamic so that as discovery controllers came and went from the environment um, uh, that we could detect them automatically and connect to them and, and determine if there was storage for that host available. And we also wanted the design to be capable of being highly available. We didn't want any sort of design uh, criteria getting in the way of that. Um, and then we also agreed that the solution must scale. It, and, it, and it would need to support, at a minimum, direct connect, which is where you have a host directly connected to your storage via a physical cable. And that's useful in test and dev environments. And then the reason that I personally was pushing for that was that um, we didn't support that connectivity uh, scheme uh, in the first release of FCOE. Um, and uh, in, in FCOE was trying to do a similar thing moving uh, over to Ethernet. And uh, it, was, it was a big limitation uh, with it. Um, so we wanted to support that day one. We also wanted a single broadcast domain uh, uh, configuration that would be able to have some number of hosts and storage all participating in a single broadcast domain um, and just be able to discover the storage directly. So on the storage ports are these things called direct, data, direct um, discovery controllers. And it would be great to not have to have a centralized discovery control. And we, we, felt, we felt that was going to be really appropriate for customers who are coming from a legacy iSCSI background. And then the centralized discovery controller, this is the new thing that we added in TP8010 uh, uh, that we were referring to earlier. This is going to be useful for environments that are, are larger, um, you know, maybe dozens of hosts, uh, or, you know, certainly tens of hosts and, uh, and multiple storage subsystems. And the idea being that you could interact with the CDC and use it to discover which storage subsystems each host should be communicating to. And this is very similar to what um, Fiber Channel does with their fabric services. And, and, uh, and, and that's why we think this, this particular approach is probably best suited to customers who are coming from a legacy Fiber Channel background. So prior to the work that we had done on automation, uh, setting up uh, a host to communicate with storage using NVMe TCP was a very manual process. And it consisted of um, the host admin configuring the host to connect to a discovery controller on the subsystem at a particular IP address. And once that's done, um, the storage admin could provision namespaces or storage volumes to the host, to that host NQN, and of course, the storage admin could have done this ahead of time by knowing what the host NQN was and manually typing that into the storage subsystem. But um, there's a lot of it, you know, you can run into a lot of um, configuration issues that way, errors, it's error prone. 
Um, so also, um, so once you've got the, st the storage provision to the host, the host admin can now discover and connect to the IO controllers um, on the subsystem. And then you get to repeat those steps on every host for each subsystem that you need to connect to. And it's a lot of work. It's very similar to configuring iSCSI. Um, so one of the first things we did was let's let's see how we can automate the discovery of discovery controllers in the environment. And um, in this case, we we proposed uh, this technical proposal 8009, and it and it describes how a host or a subsystem could use multicast DNS or MDNS to discover the IP address of any discovery controllers that are located on the same broadcast domain. And uh, and I'm just going to point out um, that. On the host, I've added this box called NVMe STAS. NVMe STAS is an open source Linux, uh, open source um, automated discovery client for Linux. Uh, and it's it's maintained by Dell. Martin Belanger uh, works at Dell and is a maintainer for this. And um, But it's again, it's open source. It's intended to work with any subsystem, any centralized discovery controller using anybody's network. We're not trying to do something proprietary here. It's, it's literally. We're just trying to enable the ecosystem with this. And the way that this works is that um, as either the subsystem or the host comes online, they can use MDNS to discover the IP address of the discovery uh, controller automatically. Well, when that happens, um, the host can go ahead and connect to that discovery controller, again, without any user intervention, and, uh, and connect to it. Now, once that connection happens, again, the storage admin could provision namespaces to the host. Um, once that happens, an asynchronous event notification would notify the host that, hey, something just happened, and, and the host would eventually understand that it can connect to an I.O. controller. And then, again, you repeat these steps, one through three in this case, not, not um, uh, which are different than the one through three on the previous slide, um, uh, for, for each host on each subsystem. Now, this, this works well in that it discovers the discovery controller automatically. The downside to it is that the host connects to every discovery controller that it discovers. And that creates a scalability problem. You have full mesh discovery, um, which is, uh, you know, it, it will only allow you to go so big. And that's why I say this is probably only really good for up to, you know, tens of hosts um, and, and a few subsystems. So then what we did was we said, okay, that's great. Now we can discover discovery controllers automatically. Um, but we wanted to add, solve that scalability problem. So we added in this concept of a centralized discovery controller or a CDC. Um, again, this was defined in TP8010. And again, NVMe STAS plays an integral role here. Uh, and what it does uh, is the first time the host and the subsystem are coming up or any time uh, they detect a network event, they'll use MDNS to discover the centralized discovery controller connect to it and register discovery information with it. Now, I, I keep using MDNS as the thing that kicks this off, but you can also use DNS. You could also manually configure the IP address of the single CDC in your environment on a per SAN basis. I mean, there's a couple of different ways you can do that. You don't have to use MDNS. Um, and then zoning is performed on the CDC. Um, and then um, once the zoning has been performed or uh, you know, you decide you don't want to do the zoning on the on the CDC. You'd rather do it on the array. Um, you could provision namespaces to a specific host NQN, and then have the storage send the zoning information to the CDC on its on its own behalf uh, and update the zoning. And that's that's called subsystem driven zoning. It's similar to target driven zoning with fiber channel. And then after zoning, the host would receive that asynchronous event notification, use get log page, and go ahead and connect to every I/O controller. Um, and then you get to repeat, again, steps one and two, one being optional um, uh, on, you know, for each host um, on each subsystem. And if you had a way of provisioning, um, you know, just going into the storage, provisioning uh, user interface, uh, you could potentially just do all of your work there and everything will get updated automatically, sort of baked into the protocol. So I mentioned NVMe STAS earlier. Um, it's automated storage discovery for Linux. Um, I mentioned it's open source and it's maintained by somebody who works at Dell. Um, I just a little bit about that is, um, it, uh, it, you know, what's the underpinning of it? And uh, you know, we've had some in interesting discussions recently uh, in the open source community about should we use NVMe CLI, the existing way to 
to interact with NVMe or or NVMe Stas. And to me, the answer is both. Actually, um, you know, libNVMe sort of underpins both NVMe CLI and NVMe Stas. Um, and I think using NVMe CLI for manual or one-shot configuration makes a ton of sense. Um, and I would also then therefore say that using NVMe Stas for dynamic automated discovery of storage um, also makes sense because NVMe Stas can react to asynchronous event notifications, can react to MDNS updates, and those sorts of things and connect to discovery controllers, again, automatically. And um, that's a huge benefit, I think, and it, it gives a really good user experience. Now, I'm not going to go into this slide in any hey, amount of detail. Um, yeah. Oh, actually, maybe, yeah, maybe you're about to cover it on this slide. I got a, a question here on NVMe staff that, that I thought might be a, a good time for you to touch on. OK. Yeah, people were asking, is it like an inbox solution? and and EPEL solution or a prototype or? So we have been working really hard to get NVMe Stas uh, as an inbox solution. Um, hmm. And I'm not sure we're 100% there yet, but if this is something that you'd like to see in box, please bring it up with your distro of choice um, and, and let them know. Um, yeah, I'll just leave it there. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, and we do have several other questions as well. When you when you're at a good breaking point. Yeah, there. let's let's uh, just time wise. I mean, we might need to hold them till the end at this point. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, but if you see one jumping out that needs to be answered, Christine. <laughs> um, so I, I'm not going to go over this chart in detail. I I literally put it in here just for your use later on if you want to refer to it and you want to get a better understanding of what NV uh, of what NVMe Stas does versus NVMe CLI. Again, it's not an either or; it's a both. And you just using using the one when it makes sense makes uh, is probably the best way to go. Think about this. Now I, I wanted to talk about the dedicated versus converged topology sort of debate that's going on right now because. Anybody who's coming sort of from the fiber channel background would think, um, oh, the way that you build a SAN is you have SAN A, SAN B, and a, and a separate LAN, and that's what works very well. And you're right, it works extremely well for fiber channel. It's pretty much the standard way to deploy. Um, and you know, so switches and ports are dedicated to the SAN to NVMe TCP. Uh, in, in an NVMe TCP context, um, you would have a similar uh, deployment strategy available to you. Uh, it's, again, this would be switches and ports dedicated to NVMe TCP SAN traffic. Um, the reason I like it is it's isolated. It, it helps um, uh, reduce attack vectors such as man in the middle and impersonation. Uh, and if you wanted to scale up SAN A or SAN B, you could do so spine leaf, whatever, whatever topology you wanted to use. That's not necessarily that important. I, I will give you one exception in a minute. The other approach is this converged LAN and SAN um, use the same IP network for both LAN and NVMe TCP storage traffic. And you have a couple of options there. You could dedicate a, 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 a virtual a VLAN for SAN A and another one for SAN B. That's the way I would recommend uh, if you're going to go converged. Um, uh, again, this is familiar to IP networking teams. Uh, primarily, you can use reuse existing switches as long as they're 25 gig. Uh, 10 gig will probably work. Um, and if uh, NVMe TCP traffic is going to be sharing up links, you need some sort of congestion monitoring and avoidance tools. Um, it's just a best practice at this point. Um, and again, you can scale. So those are the two, uh, you know, dedicated versus converged. Um, and that's going to play into uh, some of the slides that I've got coming up here. But I wanted to really quickly talk about this, this because when we start talking about converged, there seems to be a bit of a confusion about link aggregation versus storage multipathing and why each is needed. Um, link aggregation is where you have multiple network interfaces acting as a single logical link. Um, typically, some amount of network configuration is required to form the lag. Um, it enables link level resiliency. And, but it does not protect against upper layer protocol related configuration issues that cause the data unavailability event. And an example would be a zoning or a masking. Um, storage multipathing, on the other hand, utilizes and really expects multiple network interfaces to ensure the isolation of each path. Um, network configuration is not required for storage multipathing outside of having paths through the network. Um, it enable end-to-end -end resiliency, uh, and I'll show you how that works in a second. It helps prevent a data unavailability event due to uh, upper layer protocol misconfiguration. So what does that mean? 
Well, if we look at this, we have a, uh, this example. This is a SAN A, SAN B configuration. We have, um, we're going to show paths um, to storage volumes being independent and how a single uh, configuration activity should not cause a data unavailability event. So this is your host and your storage. Note that there's a LAN, a SAN A, and a SAN B, and I've got them shown as VLANs here. Um, and the, as you're provisioning um, the you know, connectivity in this environment, it basically breaks down into transport and upper layer protocol configuration steps. So of course, you're going to need to assign interfaces on the host to a specific VLAN and, an I, and give them IP addresses. And you'd do the same thing on your storage. Um, you would, uh, for example, up here on the host, there would be a host NQN. Uh, in this case, we'll just say it's NQNA. And, um, and eventually, you're going to want to have that host connect to two subsystems, uh, to, two, to a subsystem instance. In this case, it's NQN store one. That's a little hard to see. Uh, and you'll connect to them at these IP addresses down here at the storage. Now, uh, when uh, on, the, on the storage side, as soon as that host connects, you'll have a couple of controllers, uh, one for each uh, connection. And that's uh, you know, covering the transport configuration steps. Now, once you've got all that configured, the next step would be to provision storage to, uh, to the host. And you would say, OK, we'll give it to host NQNA. And then um, that would then become namespaces or storage volumes that show up on a specific path. Now, what that does to the host is, well, it discovers that we have two volumes available. And at this MPIO layer, um, it would convert them into a single volume that could be used. And then if you write to that single volume, the data gets sent down one of two paths. This is, this is multi-pathing. Uh, and you, know, you, would put a, you could put a file system on that volume. And then, of course, that gets presented to the application. Now, the important point here is that why I walked you through all that is because there are two completely independent paths. Uh, from the host to the storage, there's the SAN A path, and then there's the SAN B path. And if you make a configuration error, like again, zoning or something along those lines on SAN A, you've still got connectivity via SAN B. Um, and I can't tell you how many customers I've seen um, create a data unavailability event because they had a zoning issue and they did it to both SANs at the same time. So that's, that's why I, I think SAN A, SAN B is still a really good idea in the storage world. Um, an alternative to this, though, is, and, and again, if you wanted to, this is a single SAN configuration. So you have a single logical path to storage volumes. Now, this does protect against the loss of a single physical link, uh, but it could lead to a DU if you do something wrong on SAN A. So in this case, the two, conf the two ports coming out from the host are, are, are bonded or lagged together. Um, this, um, and, and, but notice that. Because they are lagged, they've got basically, they're on a single VLAN with a single IP. And what that does, even though you've got two connections from the storage, um, what it effectively does is make you have a single logical path to the storage. And so if you mess up something on the SANA configuration, you've just lost all your paths to storage. And um, that, that's what I would say about uh, link aggregation. Now, the next topic that's worth talking about um, is accessing storage over L2 and L3 networks. And, um, and the reason I want to bring this up is because the network topology of an IP-based SAN has an impact on the host's ability to access external storage. And an L2-based IP SAN is, is a SAN in which the host interfaces accessing external storage interfaces are on the same subnet. And the configuration for this is very straightforward, and I'll show you that in a second. Um, the L3-based IP SAN is where host interfaces are accessing external storage interfaces that are not on the same subnet. And this does require additional configuration when you're using Linux or Windows. And so let's get into those details. So accessing storage, um, inter host and storage interfaces are on the same layer two subnet. Uh, we've got a host, uh, H. Uh, we've got, it's got three interfaces on it, E3, E4, E0. Um, E3 is associated with SAN A, E4 is with SAN B, and then E0 is the management, and we have the default gateway associated with E0. Um, all the subnets in these examples are going to be slash 24, so that means that the network portion, the subnet is defined by the first three octets, so it's 10, 10, 3, and uh, for example, on storage X, and then, and then the, the host on that network is the last octet, or 21, and that's going to come into play here. Um, so if I wanted to, for example, get to 10.10.3.21 on storage X from the host, and I wanted to validate connectivity, 
I could just use something like ping, right? Just ping 10, 10, 3, 21. Everybody, I'm sure most people on the call have done this at some point in the past. And if you do that, um, because you're trying to get to 10, 10, 3, which is again, the network portion of the address, as the host is looking for how to get there, it can say, oh, I can check my route table and I've got an entry for 10, 10, 3. It's the first entry. And to get to that IP address, I go out E3. And so that's what it will do. It will say, hey, uh, ARP out, who has 10, 10, 3, 21? And you get a response. Hey, I do, here's my Mac. Um, and then you know the ICMP echo request can go out and you'll get a response and, and everything works. So that's, uh, you know, that's for that interface, similar process for 10, 10, 4. You'd hit that entry in the IP route table. And then anything else would hit that entry and would get sent out the default gateway. So that's pretty straightforward. I think most IP SANs I've seen are layer two um, for the following reason. So uh, accessing storage over layer, uh, so accessing uh, host and storage interfaces are on different layer two subnets. Um, this gets a little challenging. Similar situation as before with the configuration, except we've added uh, a, a layer three network in the middle. And note that the storage is no longer attached to the same subnet as the host. Uh, it's now, instead of being on 10.10.3, it's on 10.10.77 for this uh, SAN A. And, and for this one, the 10, it's no longer on 10.10.4, it's on 10.10.88. Uh, All right, so in order for us to go out and reach 10.10.77.2, again, we might ping uh, that IP address. And unfortunately, what's gonna happen is because there is no IP route table for 10.10.77, uh, route table entry for 10.10.77, what actually happens is it hits the default route and you end up sending out an ARP on the LAN for your storage, which is you don't want that. It could work, by the way, if, if all these networks are routable, you could hit the storage interface and start doing your storage traffic over your LAN. And that's, again, you don't want that. Um, so how would you solve this? Well, oh, by the way, there's a similar issue for, for 10, 10, 88 and also for, you know, obviously the anything that's not recognized in general. So um, to solution, to the solution to this problem, there are a few, um, but the, the most basic is to manually update the route table. Um, and so in this case, I've put an entry in for 10.10.77.2. You could also have said 10.10.77.0 if you just wanted to get the whole subnet. But, um, and we've provided a next hop IP. And if you do this, if you try to get out to that, that storage interface and you do your ping, it'll hit that entry and everything will work perfectly fine. And same thing for 10, 10, 88. Uh, oh, but 10, 10, 88 would still not work because you don't have an entry for that. And uh, again, anything in general would, would go out that default gateway. And so the full solution to this from a manually updating route, the route table perspective would be to add in all those entries or, or and add in one 10, 10, 77.0 and one 10, 10, 88.0 entry and, and you should be good. But that's a lot of work, right? That's a lot of work to do that on on all of your hosts. So we, we came up with a way to automate this that uses NVMe STAS and uh, the CDC. Uh, and so it works like this. A couple of changes here. Um, this destination database um, is something internal to NVMe STAS. Um, I just want to point out that none of what I'm going to propose here modifies the existing IP routing table on the host. Um, you will. Uh, it doesn't modify anything on the host. It will just use these entries. And we didn't want to modify the routing table for a number of reasons. But uh, anyway, it's a, uh, uh, it, mainly because it's a pain in the neck to clean up. So really quickly, how this would work, um, when the storage connects um, to the network um, and it discovers that there's a centralized discovery controller in here, there's a CDC, it will register itself. And that entry gets put into the name server database up here in the upper right. Um, and and we also have an entry for the host H, also in the name server database. And we're assuming that both the host and the storage, those ports have connected and have registered with the, with the CDC. There's also a zone database that's active. And we have, that entry allows the host H at a specific IP address, which happens to be E3, to connect to the IP address at 10.10.77.2. So um, this works as follows. The very first thing that would happen would be the host would send out an MDNS query and get an MDNS response from the from the CDC saying, "Hey, there's a CDC here for you to for you to interact with." Now, NVMe Stas would take that and put that into the destination database, noting that 
I have a response for 10, 10, 20, 3, 2. Um, and it's not on the same subnet as E3, because that's the 10, 10, 3 network. But I know how to get to it because I received the response on E3. So they add it into this destination database. And uh, great, that works fine. So now the, the host knows how to communicate with that CDC instance. And it will go ahead and do things like connect to it, um, initialize it. Uh, next, it will register with it, um, send an asynchronous event registration, um, asynchronous event registration uh, to the to the CDC and start keep alive. And so now you have a fully formed connection with the CDC from the host via an interface that's not even on the same network as that CDC. And you didn't have to do anything to the routing table. Now. Um, when the next thing to happen would be the host would send get log page to the CDC to discover who it's allowed to communicate with. This is typical like name server query stuff that you'd see in Fiber Channel. Um, you send a get log page and the response comes back and says, hey, you can talk to storage X at 10, 10, 77, 2. And again, uh, CDs, the, the NVMe staffs would load that stuff into the destination database and say, OK, if you're going to 10, 10, 77, 2, use E3. And, uh, so it will go ahead and do that. It will connect to the IO subsystem at 10, 10, 77, 2 using E3, and then initialize the IO controller and, um, and you know, find out what namespaces are available and so on. And so if you wanted to add additional storage ports, again here, 10, 10, 77, 3 and 10, 10, 70, uh, 77, 4, those get put into the name server database. They would get zoned up. And as soon as they're zoned up, an asynchronous event notification will go out to the host. Those entries would be eventually be added into the destination database, and the, the, the connectivity to the storage can be done. And, and, the, and you do the same thing for SANB, and it works. I mean, we do this all the time in our lab, and it, uh, it's a standard part of our solution. Um, so just in the interest of time, I'm going to go through the next couple of slides really quick, because I do want to try and get to the demo. Um, Storage area networking security threats are there are a number of them, um, and the, the 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 ones that we're really concerned about are uh, three and four: impersonation, spoofing, and communication access. Because and the reason I'm saying we're concerned about these ones is because the other three we already have access, we already have um, solutions for. Uh, and this impersonation spoofing, uh, the the answer to this is authentication or uh, DHH MAC chap. Uh, is what was defined for this. And then for to prevent communication access, we need secure channels. And that's TLS 1.3. Um, and both of those were worked on by um, Claudio DeSanti and David Black uh, and others. Uh, but I think they were the primary authors of that. And uh, that's been ratified for at least, uh, I think at least a year now, a little over a year. Uh, so, but you really need both of these in order to completely lock down your, your IP SAM. Uh, now, the problem with this, of course, is um, if, you, if you think about uh, authentication, you need keys. And right now, the, the, the standard way to, um, to, uh, to handle keys is to handle them on each end device. And that really becomes a scalability challenge. Every subsystem needs to know all the keys of every host, and every host needs to know the keys of every subsystem. It's a, uh, it's, it's, it's a scalability nightmare. So what we needed was a centralized way to perform authentication verification and a server replying to authentication verification requests uh, that, that, could, that could provide that is called an authentication verification entity or AVE. And it maintains a centralized database of, of NQNs and key pairs. It performs authentication verification um, and, uh, and it's similar in function to a radius server and it will be integrated with uh, CDC instances or, or SFSS uh, because there's something really cool you can do here. And it's called authentication-based zoning. And I've got, it, it's like, think of it as hard zoning for IP-based SANs, although it's not exactly hard zoning because the switch doesn't, uh, doesn't enforce it, the endpoints do. Um, so it relies on the fact that you have a centralized discovery controller that enables hosts to discover storage resources and filters information returned to host and subsystem based on access control rules. Um, the authentication verification entity, the AVE, just think of that again as like a radius server, but it offloads the hosting controllers from needing to do the authentication verification and is a one-stop shop that handles all those keys. You just put the keys uh, into the AVE and, um, and then you can have them work together as part of a single solution. And by that, I mean 
you can have this AVE act as a zoning enforcement agent. So the AVE can use the zoning configuration from the CDC to determine what connections between hosts and subsystems are allowed and what are not. And, and, and the really cool thing is like if a, if a connection between a host and a subsystem is allowed by zoning, then the AVE would perform authentication verification. And if it passes, the host is allowed to connect. If, it, if the connection is not allowed via zoning, then the AVE returns immediately authentication verification failure and doesn't even need to bother with the verification. If, uh, if zoning is allowed, then again, it, it goes through uh, just fine. And so that's, that's sort of how we're focusing on providing hard zoning for IP-based SANs. Um, and I think it's functionally equivalent to what you would see uh, in hard zoning for fiber channel-based SANs, my opinion. OK, so automation. So um, I'm going to focus on Sandbox, which is a, a GitHub repo that, that contains scripts that demonstrate how to provision NVMe TCP storage to a host. Um, there are both PowerShell and Python scripts available. Uh, there's documentation up there, and there's also an SFSS instance, uh, so Dell's CDC implementation that can be downloaded and used for evaluation purposes. Again, there's no tricks here. I'm just trying to enable people to experiment with NVMe TCP if they want. And uh, along those lines of enabling people to experiment, um, we've put together, or I put together, a uh, Let's Play in an AWS-based sandbox blog post and a follow-up to that part two, and in part three is, is seems like it's perpetually delayed, but it'll be coming out. Um, and but I'll give you a little overview of what that what that looks like today. Um, so I'm just gonna uh, switch to the demo. And okay. So what I'm, what I'm showing you here is, um, and the reason that I'm showing you in, uh, this configuration, this is my sandbox virtual private cloud instance that's running in AWS. Um, it, it consists of three EC2 instances, this host one, this SFSS, which is a smart fabric storage software, our discovery services, and a, a, what I'm calling a storage instance with this, it's just a, it's just an Ubuntu host running this storage simulator. <coughs> and the reason that I, I put it here and we're doing an AWS is because it's a very convenient place to play with NVMe TCP because um, it works here and it's uh, you don't have any need to have any hardware. Also, there are um, there's a LAN network which is how we access these instances, and there's also a SAN network. Um, so we've got host one connected uh, that will connect to storage via SAN A. Host one will also access the SFSS via this network. And I've just put SAN B in here to show you that it, it would normally go here, but I'm not using it for the purposes of this demo. Now, um, in my SFSS, in my, I'm sorry, in my AWS console, you can see that I've got SFSS storage one and host one instances here. I'm going to go ahead and uh, open up SFSS and we'll open up the splash screen for it. And we'll log in. OK, so this is the splash screen. Good thing that we've got great health. Um, we'll go to the CDC instance that happens to be associated with that diagram I just showed you, a host connected here. Um, I do have subsystems. Uh, these will be names that you'll be familiar with in a moment, Starfleet, Klingons, and then this longer NQN. I also shouldn't have a zoning uh, configured or active, and I don't. So we're going to. First, get the host to connect to this SFSS instance. Again, this is running in AWS. Uh, and to do that, I'm going to have to, um, I'll show you that I don't actually have any NVMe devices right now. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, uh, start this, the NVMe STAS services, StaffD and StackD. Um, and I'm starting them manually because I didn't, I didn't have them enabled so you could see what would happen when they're enabled. But typically, they would be enabled by default. So if I start StaffD and StackD, we should be able to go over, and you can see this journal is uh, listing out what's going on. I should be able to refresh and see that I have a host, uh, the host that we were just uh, modifying, logged in. And again, it's 1010.131.231. It's and I could show you that on the diagram that it's the same, but it's, it's online and it was explicitly registered. So that's great. So um, what we would want to do is we would want to create zoning that would enable this host to see storage. Because again, all, of, all it's seeing right now is the uh, using NVMe list-v is this 
is this SFSS instance. That's its NQN. So we'd like it to see a lot more than that. We'd actually like it to see volumes on the storage. And if I look at the storage really quick, uh, this is the storage uh, console, the one I was showing to you in the, in the diagram. Uh, we've got uh, NQNs with Klingon, Starfleet, and again, that longer NQN here. Okay, so the idea is let's go ahead and get this host connected to the storage in an automated fashion. And to do that, I'm going to use the, uh, a PowerShell script. And one of the first things that I do when I start interacting with this SFSS instance is just get, us, get SFSS IP address management just to validate that I can connect to it. And, and one of the things that the script does will be to download um, the subsystems and the hosts and then use the information returned to, um, to be able to create zoning entries. So I'll go ahead and do that. I'm going to go ahead and um, sorry, right there. I'm going to go ahead and create a zone. And so this this function in this PowerShell script uh, will download all the hosts and 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 discovery uh, and and subsystems, put them into a zone, add that zone to a zone group, and then activate that zone group on SFSS. And it it will just happen should happen very quickly. But what you'll see is as soon as I do that. You should see a bunch of entries here. Um, hopefully, Murphy's going to be nice to me today. Yep. OK, so we saw a bunch of entries here. Uh, that's basically, these are normal expected uh, events when you discover uh, namespaces, at least in this specific configuration. Um, and if we do an NVMe list dash V, you'll see that I have um, many namespaces and many more subsystems available. Now, just to show you that I, I could I could also remove those uh, uh, volumes at a whim, I will go ahead and go back to SFSS, and I will go to zoning, and I will deactivate that zone, that zone group. And if we go back over here and we look, we'll see a whole bunch of events happening. And uh, if we do the NVMe list dash V, we're back to just seeing SFSS again. And again, that's just an extremely simple, trivial script, but Again, that's provided in on Sandbox as an example, so that you understand how to interact with it and and figure out however you you know do whatever you want to do with it. So that's the end of the demo there. And just really quickly, um, there are alternative configuration methods for SFSS. We support Ansible. I just showed you the REST API. There we have a CLI as well. Um, if you wanted to do it that way. And then there are tremendous amounts of resources available online. Uh, we have interactive demos. Uh, we have so many, again, in those presentations I was mentioning at the beginning of the presentation, they're, they're all listed here with links for you to go after the presentation. Uh, and I think with that, we're to Q&A. All right, thank you, Eric. Um, we have over three dozen questions here. Holy cow. So I know. So we're not going to have enough time to answer all of them, but we'll try to work through a number of them here. And then the rest we will answer via our Q&A blog that we will post um, in several days. Absolutely. Okay, let me um, let me tackle a few here. Um, you referred to the Dell open source host software. Do other vendors also have the same kind of multi-pathing storage path handling concept? Yeah, multipathing is a standard is a standard concept across uh, you know the industry. There's the, there's a Dell solution, but there's uh, you know one that's baked in for native NVMe multipathing. Um, yeah, so it's it's a pretty standard concept. All right. Uh, seems like a lot of configuration steps for the discovery. How does that compare to Fiber Channel in terms of complexity of configuration? So with, without any of the automation stuff I talked about, um, configuring NVMe TCP is a lot like iSCSI, uh, meaning you go to every end host. I, I call that end node centric provisioning. Uh, we have to go touch every endpoint to get them working. Um, Fiber Channel, uh, since day one, has had a centralized provisioning model where you go to the network and you configure the network to allow the appropriate connectivity. Um, and that's what we were designing uh, the automation features to provide for customers was that level of automation. Um, I think between the combination of MDNS and, and the centralized discovery controller, 
they are very close. Um, and uh, I really can't think of any glaring deficiencies in NVMe TCP with the you know with the enhancements that we've made that would put us at a would put it at a disadvantage for fiber channel. So it should be the same user experience. That's what we were going for. In other words. Okay. All right. Fair enough. And is the auto discovery supported natively within things like ESXi? Yes. Uh, 80U1 uh, supports uh, automated discovery and, and will continuously look for new targets and, <laughs> sorry, new subsystems and discovery controllers. Uh, and again, once it's in box on Linux, then we would get the same functionality from Linux. Got it. When you were doing the performance comparisons, were there specific um, hardware offloads for NVMe over TCP, or was it a, just a general? It was, you know, that's one of the most frustrating things about NVMe TCP right now. It's all software based. It's all done in software. Um, there were offloads available when we first started this project, um, but uh, the primary vendor for that got out of um, the, the Ethernet adapter business and uh, and they had really nice hardware offloads, um, but so we're we're working to get them back. Um, I can't really say anything about it right now. It's all futures looking, but um, I, I know there's a there's a push in the industry to get back to hardware acceleration for NVMe TCP. Okay, all right, that's good to know. Let's see. Um, when you were talking about CPU utilization, was that at the host level or array? That's at the host. Good question. Good. And then there's um, several questions about, hey, where's RDMA and why wasn't that included in the comparison and how would it compare? Uh, I, uh, um, that's a great question. I didn't do any testing of, of RDMA um, uh, on, in, our, in our test configuration that I just showed you. Um, I, I did it for a, a, the reason that we don't support it on our, on our storage platform. So there was no, nothing for me to test against. Um, uh, that said, I did a, um, and you know, NVMe over fabrics going beyond the performance hero numbers webinar. I think we're almost at two, uh, two years ago, uh, or, or maybe a year ago, um, uh, that 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 looked at, you know, what the difference. I think it was two years ago, um, that that looked at the difference between Rocky, uh, you know, RDMA and uh, and and NVMe TCP, and uh, Rocky does very very well. It's it it performs very well. Uh, it's got low latency. Um, uh, the only thing about Rocky that I'm, I'm not a huge fan of is the amount of configuration it takes um, and uh, the issues that you can get into with congestion spreading um, as it, you know, as you scale. So if any of you are familiar with fiber channel and slow drain or congestion spreading and fiber channel, um, you get into those sorts of problems when you have oversubscription. And, um, and, and it's also due to the fact that the network is lossless. And uh, since the recommended default for configuration for Rocky uses a lossless transport, you can get into the same types of issues. and um, But I think if you were to go back and look at the NVMe going before, beyond the performance hero numbers, I, I have a number of pros and cons for NV, NVMe TCP, Rocky, and Fiber Channel uh, that are available there. Sounds good. All right. And then a couple of clarification things sure. um, or confirmation. NVMe over TCP does support routing and does support lag? Yes. Yes. Um, it, yes it, both. <laughs> sorry, what? Yes to both of those. Routing yes to and both. Leg. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. It's IP. So um, yeah, it'll work. And it does work. Okay, very good. Uh, is IPv6 supported? Yes. And if so, are any improvement in response times? I, I, you know what? I did not test IPv6 for the performance uh, dimension dimension of it, um, so I, I can't say one way or the other. Got it. All right. And then uh, there were other questions about, hey, you know, what if you were using the latest version of Fiber Channel, or what if you were using 100 gig NICs? I, I you talked about scalability, so I assume you would expect all of those to scale as as new standards and new things come available. Yeah, 100 gig would work fine. Um, you know, the comparison against 64 gig fiber channel, um, you know, obviously that's double the speed of 32, so it wouldn't be the same comparison. Fair enough. But yeah, I didn't do any 64 gig versus 100 gig at this up to this date. Okay, 
And then last question that we'll tackle verbally here. Uh, TP8010, is that already ratified or when would you expect it to be ratified? Yes, it's been ratified uh, since February of last year. Uh, both TP8009 and 8010 are, are available. Everything I talked about today is... Links, was there a link to that spec? I did not include a link to 8010. I, I think there's there's a concern that it's uh, you need a login to NVM Express to get it, I'm pretty sure. But uh, mm -hmm. so there's that. Um, but everything that I talked about today is based on standards that have been ratified. So. Very good. All right. Well, we got through a bunch of the questions. And as I said, the rest we will tackle in the written Q&A, which we will post as a blog. Cool. Uh, we'll try to get to that in within the next week if we can. And I really appreciate everyone joining today. Please go in and, and rate the presentation, as I mentioned at the beginning. Give us any suggestions you have for follow-on topics or other topics you'd love to see us cover. And I think that that's a wrap for today. Thanks very much, Eric. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for joining it. We appreciate it.